So I'm going to start out by asking the question. I mean, it sounds like a simple question. What do we want from our oceans? Let me see if I've got this right. We want seafood, lots of it, diversity of yummy flavors. We want good fishing. We want to be able to scuba dive and snorkel and see amazing things on tropical reefs and temperate reefs and just the wonder of what's in the water. We want to be able to have sports like surfing and, you know, we want to be able to enjoy the ocean safely. <laughs> we want to be able to walk on beautiful, pristine beaches with the one we love. We want our children to be able to enjoy the beaches just like we did when we were kids. We want animals in the southern hemisphere to be able to enjoy their beaches too, and things in the northern hemisphere too. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty attached to oxygen. So <laughs> I think that's a really important thing that we need from our oceans. But it's not necessarily like that. We think it is because it doesn't seem to be affecting us from what we see. But it's not necessarily like that. So I love this series of photos. This was um, in the Florida Keys. This is a, um, a, a sport fishing company. And um, uh, oops. This one was from the 1950s, and there's a whole lot of very large fish. Uh, this one, whoops, this one from the 1970s. There's still some large fish, but there's also some small fish. But importantly, there's still a lot of fish. This one from the 1990s, there's fewer fish, and they're all small fish. They're not only small fish, the type of fish has completely changed from large resident fish to smaller transitory fish. And so the type of fish has actually changed in addition to the number of fish and the size of fish. In other words, the entire fish population has it, it catastrophically changed, comprehensively changed. And that's just one sport fishing company in one little place that we happen to have a really good record. Also notice that all of these guys are really smiling. They're really proud of what they've caught because they think they've taken home the absolute prize without having any idea of how degraded it is. There's also toxic fish. Now the problem with toxic fish is that when we're looking at a fillet on our plate or a fish fillet crumbed or a fish fillet in a filet of fish at you know, everybody's favorite takeaway apparently, um, we have no idea what that looked like before it was filleted. And it's not just the, the growths and things. We have no idea what chemicals might be in these fish. We have to just trust that it's safe and healthy. Plastic is a massive, massive problem. Who of us has not gone down to the river and seen Coke bottles bobbing along and, you know, Coke cans and beer bottles and whatever cast up on the shore and tumbleweeds of plastic bottles against fences and, you know, we are absolutely burying ourselves in plastic. And more plastic. In fact, this, this factoid, every piece of plastic ever made still exists. This absolutely frightens me, and it's absolutely true. We haven't had enough time between the 1940s when plastic was invented and the time it takes to break it down. Oh, it breaks down into smaller pieces, but it doesn't actually disappear. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then it gets into the food chain by getting into little tiny organisms that see these little plastic particles, and they go, hmm, food that doesn't swim away when I nibble at it. And more plastic. 
seriously a problem. Um, many, many seabirds are being found dead with a gut full of plastic. It's horrible. And this is what happens. They eat the plastic because it looks like a fish. It doesn't run away when they catch it. They eat it and then their stomach stops sending them the hunger signal because it's full, but it's full of things that they can't get any nutrition from. They can't break down, they can't digest, they just have a full stomach, and then they starve to death with a gut full of plastic. Sea urchins are expanding like lava. If you've seen anything coming down the east coast of Tasmania, this is really shocking. You know, the thing is, the sea urchins are very visible. You know, they're mowing down the kelp, they're displacing the, the abalone, they're displacing the crayfish, but they are not the only pest. In fact, jellyfish, my favorite guys, we have at least six different introduced species of jellyfish here in Tassie at least. And no funding and no research. How cool is that? Red tides, massive problem. Now, I happen to be quite a fan of red tides at the moment because our favorite red tide here in Tassie, um, a critter called Noctiluca scintillans. It's Latin for sparkling nightlight. How cool is that? So our favorite red tide down here causes the bioluminescence that we enjoy at night. But make no mistake, this red tide is bad news. It's an introduced marine pest, and it's causing a lot of problems for living things in the water. Oh, and more red tides. Oh, there's lots of red tides. This is what happens with red tides, even if they're not red. They don't even have to be any color at all. Um, this is not actually a gravel road. This is dead fish. What happened was this school of fish swam into this area with a, a, an algae, a toxic algae bloom. And they simply died. And more dead fish. This picture horrifies me. Can you imagine what that would have smelled like to be there? Ooh. And more dead fish. In fact, we've got fish kills like these all over the world, super common, because we are changing our coastal ecosystems to be less hospitable to living things. Oh, well, I should say living things, but you know, little nasty microbes, not what we want as living things. Um, and we keep spewing all kinds of stuff into the atmosphere that's not only warming the planet, it's also through a weird chemical reaction. It's actually acidifying the ocean. It, it, the seawater isn't turning to acid. It's just getting a little bit more corrosive notch by notch by notch and then organisms with shells and skeletons they can't make the shells and skeletons and they can't keep the shells and skeletons and they can't repair the shells and skeletons and corals are bleaching you know once upon a time this happened rarely now it happens regularly and when corals bleach, it's a one-way process. If they bleach enough, if they can't recover, then they get overgrown by algae, and that's it. They die. They can't come back. They can't recover. Once they're covered with algae, no more coral reef. And, uh, oh yeah, spewing things. Hmm. Not sure why that one's out of order. Anyway, sorry about that. This one used to be with the other spewing things. Anyway, we're st spewing even more things into the atmosphere. And animals are reacting to these changes. For example, we all hear about polar bears, you know, losing their ice flows and stuff like that. Well, when polar bears can't hunt, they find a way to find food. And when the adults are eating the young, something's wrong. Something's really wrong. Because then there's nobody for the next generation. And we're seeing this. This is not an isolated incident. And critters with shells and skeletons, I mentioned earlier, they're leaching away like osteoporosis. 
and it's happening to so many different organisms. These are sea butterflies. They're some of my favorite organisms on the planet. They're these little tiny itty bitty little snails and they have these little wings and they just flutter like butterflies and they're incredibly numerous and they're pretty much, whoop, uh -oh, sorry, okay, <laughs> sorry, out of range. <laughs> Um, so the sea butterflies are pretty much food for everything bigger than a sea butterfly, but the problem is their shells are leaching away like osteoporosis. So what we're seeing here, um, this one is a healthy shell. This one is where it was in acidified waters, and they can't recover from that. They simply can't live through that. Oops, wait, wrong one. Oops, wait. Oh, here. Okay. And so corals are also leaching away their skeletons like osteoporosis. Now, this is actually an experimental uh, situation. I mean, it was done in a laboratory at um, the type of uh, the, the level of carbon dioxide in the water that's expected around 2100. Now, what happened is these corals lost their skeletons. And they look quite beautiful, don't you think? But you can imagine that if a coral needs its skeleton for protection and for support and communicate with other corals, you know, other coral polyps around it and all of that, there's a reason that corals have their thick skeletons. And yet, if they're going to leach away like this by 2100, or maybe a little faster, because we're actually a little bit faster than those estimates were predicting. Um, I mean, that's a massive, massive change. They're not going to be able to make reefs, coral reefs, the most diverse, most biodiverse uh, ecosystem on the planet. Imagine how sad this world will be without coral reefs and all the organisms that call them home. And while all these things are happening, these guys are having a field day. So jellyfish are booming like never before, which is kind of cool because I study jellyfish, but it's kind of not cool because I'm a human and I live here and I don't want jellyfish to be the dominant organism in the ocean. I don't want jellyfish to be sort of the thing that that's all we see and that's all we can eat. I actually don't like eating jellyfish. It, it, it's nothing emotional. I just don't like the mouthfeel or the taste. Well, it's not really the taste, it's the mouthfeel. Anyway, sorry, let me just go back. So this critter, uh, Catastylus mosaicus, it looks awfully beautiful like this, but not so beautiful like that. And this is a common occurrence in Morton Bay every summer and in Port Phillip Bay and in Sydney Harbor and in Illawarra and in Botany Bay, and, 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 and. We see this in many, many places around Australia, and the Tamar from time to time, not every summer, but too many summers. And like this, where they're washing up on the beaches in huge numbers, they're like wallpaper, they're so abundant. And this is one of my very favorite species. It's a deep sea species called Paraphylla paraphylla. How beautiful is that? It's an absolutely splendid species, but not when it's taking over the fjords of Norway. So this particular fjord is quite well studied. Um, the fish have disappeared, and with it, the fisheries that used to be there. Now it's just jellyfish. You put the net in the water, you do a trawl, you get a bunch of jellyfish. And it's not just that fjord, it's numerous fjords and other fjords are getting worse. They're changing to being dominated by jellyfish. And this species, okay, so the, um, the contrast there isn't perfect, sorry about that, but trust me, it is a very, very beautiful species. It's got this icy blue coloration. I'm absolutely in love with this species. It's from the Eastern Mediterranean off the coast of Israel. It was only discovered as a new species about 10 or 15 years ago but it's not so pretty when it's like this. So this is a nuclear power plant that had an emergency shutdown because thousands of these got caught in the, the intake pipes for the cooling system. So each of these, these are all jellyfish. 
each of these bumps and lumps going all the way back and out of sight are jellyfish. Now that's just one photo from one day from one power plant. In fact, this is a really common occurrence. Jellyfish get caught in power plants. And by the way, can I just say uh, nuclear powered submarines too, just saying. So anyway, um, so you can imagine when you have nuclear power and you have an emergency shutdown, things have the potential for going badly because if it's an emergency shutdown, it's not quite as controlled as when it's not an emergency. This happens all the time. Well, not every day, but too often. All over the world, we see this happening. Nuclear power plants, coal-fired power plants, desalination plants, water-cooled data centers, air conditioning systems, even CSIRO air conditioning system got shut down because of jellyfish. We see this happening with anything that's got water being sucked in to pipes for cooling. The jellyfish get sucked in and shut down the cooling and then things go badly. Okay, this is another one of my favorite species. I swear, I'm not just gonna run through all my species. That would be 4,000 pretty much, okay? So we won't go all of them. But I do love this one. This is the sea tomato um, because it's the size and shape and color of a tomato, right? Absolutely exquisite, but not like this. That's a little too much. Oh, and by the way, they sting quite wickedly. So this was at Broome uh, up in the northwest of WA. This was, I can't remember, I think about five or six or seven months later um, to the south um, on 80 Mile Beach. And the person that took this photo, it went, he called me and he said, oh my God, Lisa, you're not going to believe. He said, I drove more than 20 kilometers down the beach looking for a place to photograph my birds. The birds couldn't land. There was too many jellyfish. For 20 kilometers, it looked like this and beyond. He just had no idea how far it went. I'll tell you how far it went. This was taken at Exmouth another six or 12 months later, about nine months later, I think. So for a period of, uh, I think it was 13 months all up, the coast of WA was socked in with sea tomatoes. In fact, they went all the way from Derby in the very, very far Northwest, all the way down to Rottnest Island off of Perth. It's 1,200 kilometers of sea tomatoes. That's insane. I'm pretty sure you would have been able to see them from space. I don't know, I wasn't in space, but I'm pretty sure with numbers like that, you could. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, sorry, let me just go back. So every single one of those is eating stuff. They're eating plankton and all of the plankton that's powering that tremendous population growth rate, that's plankton that other things don't have to eat. So you think about the impact on the ocean, it's enormous, but we're not researching it. There's no funding for it. There's no research on it. This and other gobsmacking events of jellyfish taking over ecosystems and damaging and impacting ecosystems. There's no funding. There's no research. We are using prayer as our management strategy. Good luck with that. Okay, this is one of my very, very, very favorite species. Aurelia, the moon jellyfish. It's exquisitely beautiful. It also happens to be the first species that I ever worked with more than 30 years ago, which blows my mind. I cannot believe I've been having a love affair, an unrequited love affair, by the way, with jellyfish for 30 years. But here's the problem. We have a really bad Aurelia problem, a moon jelly problem right here in Tassie. We're not the only ones. Aurelia is a total pest the world over. But right here, we're not immune to it. Just a few years ago, um, Huon Aquaculture, the second largest salmon farming company in Tasmania, lost 64% of its profit for the year because of jellyfish, just that one company, just that one year. I'm telling you, somebody should be researching this stuff. So there's lots and lots of species, about 4,000 species of jellyfish all up. They're not all total pests, but some are, and they're not all total pests everywhere, but some are some places, and they're responding to changes that we're doing to the ocean. Let's have a look at that. 
Oh, yes. Why? Okay, so we're doing all kinds of cool stuff to the ocean. You know, we're um, introducing species, carrying them around. You know, we use ships like portable aquariums and zoos. We transport species all over the world. No passport required. They don't even have to pay their own way. They get to another place that has the same look and feel and taste as the place they've just been, but no predators. And they go, woohoo! I mean, you know, um, Asterius, the sea star, Aurelia, the jellyfish, Centra, well, okay, Centra Stephanus didn't come on um, uh, didn't come in a boat, it came down with climate change, but it doesn't matter how things are getting carried around. Trust me, there's tons and tons of stuff getting carried around every day. Um, overfishing, you know, we think of overfishing as being like completely devastated, like no fish left. No, things happen before we get to that place where there's no fish left. And what happens is it gets harder and harder and harder for fish to survive. And, and this is happening the world over. We are taking more fish than can replenish the world over. Um, coastal construction. This is one of my favorite problems because it seems so good. It's like, oh, look at all that free space. We should develop that. We should put aquaculture facilities. We should put bays and harbors so people can bring in boats. And, you know, we should build things to house nuclear submarines and, you know, whatever, right? So, you know, develop that undeveloped area. But here's the problem. Every single time you put anything at all in the water, it's a place where something can settle. Something can take that real estate and call it home. And the thing that takes that real estate and calls it home is whoever's first on site. You know, whatever lands there first usually gets to claim it. And too often, that's jellyfish. Um, eutrophication. This is a fancy word for too much crap too much fertilizer. And it's this chemical process that happens in the water that takes out the oxygen and turns things into a dead zone. It, it, it's an incredibly simple process with a really, really complicated, um, complicated problem. Well, it's not that complicated, everything dies. The complicated part is trying to undo it. And what happens is when you get a dead zone, and then the weather changes and everything's good and it comes back. It has a memory. It builds a memory and it snaps back into a dead zone so easily. We're seeing this in Macquarie Harbor. We're seeing this in the Contra Costa Channel. We're seeing this hundreds and hundreds of places the world over. Pollution. Oh my God. Oi, pollution. Don't even get me started. Pollution. Climate change. Okay, I don't need to convince you guys that, you know, things are warming, right? Tasmania is warming, what is it? Something like um, four times faster than the global average. I can't remember if that's the exact right number, but it's something like that. It's a really, really scary speed that Tasmanian waters are warming compared to the rest of the world and ocean acidification. I'd mentioned before uh, um, that it's this sort of um, uh, like the evil twin of climate change. So you've got the warming of the water, you know, CO2 into the atmosphere, water warms, greenhouse effect, blah, blah, blah. But that uh, carbon dioxide in the ocean, sorry, the carbon dioxide in the air gets absorbed by the ocean and it uh, turns the seawater a bit more acidic. And so here's the problem. All of these things, we only think about them, we think about that one, and then we think about that one, but they're all happening at the same time. The oceans are just so impacted by all of these things together at the same time. And in many cases, these things have synergistic effects where the sum uh, um, the, the sum is great. Okay, um, you know what I mean, where the total is greater than the sum of the parts. Okay, I'm messing it up, but you know what I mean, okay? It's bad, put it that way. There's an interaction and it's not good. Sorry for uh, losing that, that way of saying it that's so perfect, but you know what I mean. 
So carbon dioxide, um, sorry, uh, carbon dioxide, warmer water, overfishing, habitat damage, turbid waters, nutrient pollution, plastic pollution, ballast transport. These are happening every day, everywhere. It, 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 it's unbelievable how much we are impacting the oceans. But here's the thing, we don't see it because it all happens under the cloak of the water. We look out and it looks so beautiful and it looks today just like it looked 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. It's still blue, it still glitters in the sunlight, it still looks beautiful, but it's not. It's impacted all over. Jellyfish blooms are a visible indicator that something is out of balance in the ocean. Jellyfish have this really amazing life cycle. It's not like anything that we're familiar with. So you've got your jellyfish. We all recognize that, right? You know, a little, you know, blip, 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 little bobbing thing in the water, right? But that's just one part of the life cycle. The jellyfish has babies that don't grow up to look like jellyfish. They grow up to look like these little polyps. And then these polyps, and they're stuck to things like docks and wharves and you know infrastructures so these polyps clone and they go through this weird process where they bud off these baby jellyfish that then grow up into the jellyfish that we see so the jellyfish has babies that are these little tiny clonal polyps they clone and clone and clone and clone and they make these vast colonies and then when the conditions are right these polyps bud off these baby jellyfish and so goes the population. We call it a bloom because it's like a bloom of flowers in a meadow. You look one day, you don't see it. The next day you go, whoa, where did all those come from? But this weird life cycle enables the jellyfish to do really amazing stuff. Not good for us, but really good for them. So I'm just going to go through some of the mechanisms of how jellyfish are impacting our oceans and responding to the oceans that we're giving them. They should write us a thank you letter actually because we are helping them so fantastically. So, okay, the first mechanism, the jellyfish feedback. It's really simple. It goes like this. Fewer predators and competitors leads to more jellies. More jellies leads to fewer predators and competitors. Fewer competitors and predators leads to more jellies. You get where this goes, right? So every fish that we take out, that's food that's left over for somebody else. Too often it's the jellyfish eating that, and then they get the upper hand, and they do. Okay, there's a second mechanism I wanna talk about. I lovingly call this the double whammy, the jellyfish double whammy, and it goes like this. So jellyfish, hang on, let me get my little thing. So jellyfish, eat the larvae and the eggs of other critters. But then the eggs and larvae that would eat the food, they're being eaten, but jellyfish also eat the food that the eggs and larvae would eat. So this double whammy of predation on fish and other organisms and competition with the fish and the other organisms this double whammy of predation and competition, it's a really great way to wipe out a population of pretty much everything. And then what we see is jellyfish taking over the role of top predator in these impacted ecosystems. They've done this so many times around the world. It's really stunning. This is why I wrote a book about it, Stung on Jellyfish Blooms in the Future of the Oceans. It was a bestseller. It was uh, number one on Amazon for four and a half months in three categories because people were like, whoa, I never heard of that. I had no idea that's happening. Well, now you know, and it's happening. But this double whammy is actually a triple whammy. If you think about, there's another thing happening. So it's not just the jellyfish eating the eggs and larvae and the plankton that the larvae would eat, but we're also taking out more fish. So we're helping the jellyfish take over faster 
it, it's really quite stunning. Like I said, they should send us a thank you letter because we are seriously helping them. Okay, there's also an aspect of the food chain that's really fairly disturbing. So we think of the food chain in really linear terms, right? Big things eat little things. Fast things eat slow things. Smart things eat stupid things, right? Fantastic food chain. It, it's the way that we think it is. It's the way that we learned it when we were in school. It's the way I learned it when I was in school. Jellyfish, throw that out the window. What jellyfish do is they're these incredibly simple, slow, small, like smaller than sharks and stuff, right? You know, so they're, they're not the sort of thing you would expect to be the top predator. In addition, jellyfish are kind of stupid. Now, I'm not being unkind when I say that. What I mean is they don't have a brain. They literally, and I, I, I'm not saying, oh, they're brainless. I mean, yes, they are brainless, but they literally do not have a brain. And so they're actually eating the eggs and larvae of things that have a brain, things that are bigger than them, things that are faster than them. They're eating the eggs and larvae of things higher up on the food chain than they are. And this re reverberates up the food chain to everything else. You cut out the ankles of the food chain, everything else topples. Oh, yeah, so that's, that's not happening. Okay, oh, hang on. I can't remember what this said at the top. Oh, oh fishing up, yes. So um, a few years back, there was this fantastic um, paper that came out called Fishing Down the Food Chain. And basically it goes like this. We are progressively fishing down the food chain. When we run out of swordfish and things like that, then we start eating something smaller and not only smaller, but you know, farther away to go get it. We are progressively fishing out the oceans, starting with the big easy stuff and then going farther afield and smaller and deeper. We are fishing down the food chain. Jellyfish fish up the food chain. I don't know where you meet in the middle. It's not going to be good for us. But what jellyfish are doing by eating the eggs and larvae of fish and the larvae, you know, the plankton of other species as well, they are actually fishing up by eating things that are higher on the food chain than themselves. This is the equivalent of grass eating the cows. Like there's just something not quite right about fishing up the food chain, but this is what jellyfish do. And yet there's no funding and no research. Like I said, bad. So here's a jellyfish eating a fish and it's got another one curled up inside the stomach. Like it's not even stopping when it's satiated. It's still killing and eating. I mean, come on. Oh, okay. Um, ooh, er, I can't remember what the title of this is, but basically what's going on here, in addition to eating stuff, jellyfish are also these fantastic CO2 factories. They're actually changing the ecosystems to be more favorable to themselves. So what we're seeing is, okay, you've got, you know, fish and jellyfish kind of coexisting, right? You take out the fish, you end up with a bunch of jellyfish. And then when these jellyfish die, they're actually giving off all this carbon dioxide. Well, they're not, well, a little bit, but mostly the bacteria that are um, consuming and decaying their little dead carcasses are actually giving off CO2. And it's absolutely fantastic. Some researchers in the States found a few years ago there's a weird property of jellyfish mucus and jellyfish carcasses that actually favors a certain type of bacteria over other types of bacteria. So these jellyfish mucus and jellyfish carcasses promote a certain type of bacteria over others. 
bad news. The type of bacteria that these jellyfish blooms are promoting are CO2 factories rather than um, contributing to the food chain. I mean, lots of things eat bacteria. Okay, small things, I'll give you that. But things eat bacteria. But the, the bacteria that the jellyfish are promoting they're not part of the food chain. They're just cranking out mega amounts of carbon dioxide, which is actually just adding to the whole problem that favors jellyfish. It's brilliant, scary, but brilliant without a brain. Okay, so here's what we're doing. I'm in a little diagram just to kind of show you, right? So you got some jellyfish floating around, some turtles, some fishing, nice happy coastline, right? A little bit more pollution, some farming and some pollution coming off. A few more jellyfish floating around. Okay, not so many turtles. Okay, more farming, some city pollution, a lot more jellyfish. Notice the water is getting browner and browner, right? Lots more jellyfish, no turtles. Whoops, uh oh, hang on, wait. No, we don't want wind zip. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Okay, cool. Anyway, so as we are changing our coastal waters, you know, jellyfish are the perfect organism for degraded coastlines because as the water gets more and more turbid or cloudy, fish can't see to eat. They can't find a meal. Jellyfish, no problem. They don't need to see to eat. They got these tentacles out there and things bumble into it and they eat. They're happy. A lot of jellyfish don't even need to eat. They just kind of eat. They just absorb stuff from the water. And then if there's absolutely nothing to consume, no worries. They just get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they can find stuff to eat again. And then they just start getting bigger again. It doesn't bother them. They don't care. Okay, so we think of weeds as plants, right? Like dandelions and foxtails. And I mean, we all know weeds, you know, they're growing in the garden, we rip them up, right? Weeds, we think of as plants. But jellyfish are weeds, because if you think about what makes a weed, there's certain weedy properties. You know, they're opportunistic, they're fast growing, they're everywhere, you know. So there's certain properties that make a weed. Jellyfish are weeds. So they've got that weird life cycle. They can clone in 13 different ways. I mean, come on, cloning's cool, right? Jellyfish can clone in 13 different ways. I reckon that's worthy of admiration. They're tactile feeders, that is, they don't need to see to eat. They grow fast. They don't need to grow. <laughs> they don't need to eat. If they can't eat, they degrow, and then they just regrow later. No harm, no foul. They're incredibly temperature tolerant. They're incredibly salinity tolerant. And at least four species that we know of now are truly biologically immortal. I mean, come on, think about this. All the like millennia of humanity, you know, we look up at the moon uh, and we think, oh, it'd be amazing to walk on the moon. We look at someone we love who's just passed away and we wonder what it would be like to never die. But I think never in the history of humanity did anyone think that the secret to immortality would be found in a jellyfish. But there you go. All right, so this is just what jellyfish do. Now, I love this slide. This is actually a quarry in central Wisconsin in the United States. I know it doesn't look like much. It looks like a bunch of ripples on rocks, right? Well, it is. It was a high energy sandy beach. What you're looking at here, all of these lumps and clumps, each of these little lumps are actually jellyfish that were beached and fossilized together more than 300 million years ago. This is a jellyfish bloom that happened more than 300 million years ago. And what's even more remarkable, this quarry has seven consecutive bedding planes of fossilized jellyfish blooms. They're like pages in a history book. And they tell us that jellyfish have been blooming since time immemorial. And they will continue to. And we're just giving them the tools to do it more right now.
the oceans are dying to tell us this message. Thank you. Don't go too far away. No, okay, Lisa. I'm not going. <laughs> that was fabulous. That was just oh, totally thank you. fabulous. Very depressing. But depressing, yes. We need to know. We need to know. Yeah, we things. do. Because as long as we're using prayer as our main management yeah. strategy, yeah. well, I don't even know what to say. Like, that is just yeah. so wrong. It, yes. it, I'm not saying prayer is wrong. I'm just saying it's not going to help us out of this, you know? For sure. For yeah. Sure. So, do we have any questions from the audience? You in the corner, I see you want to ask a question. You've got that look on your face. You're like, I want to ask, I want to ask, I want to ask. <laughs> Thank you for a very inspiring and thought provoking talk. It was great. Thank you. Now, to get closer to home, you mentioned you and our aquaculture, I think. Yeah. Can you analyze or tell us what might have happened there? Yeah, I can. It was real simple. So um, the salmon industry in Tasmania has had a worsening jellyfish problem for decades. Um, about 22 years ago, 23 years ago, uh, oh God, this is 2022. Okay, 24 years ago, time flies when you're having fun. 24 years ago, when I first came to Tasmania, um, they had a big kill and I was brought in as a consultant to help them understand what happened and how they can have it never happen again. And at the time, they had only really just, uh, it, it, jellyfish had just come across their radar as a potential problem. Um, when the salmon industry was first starting up in the 80s, they put together um, a booklet on jellyfish that might threaten the salmon industry. And they didn't even mention moon jellies. Like they weren't even on their radar as a species that existed here, let alone causing problems. And now today they're losing, you know, 64% of their annual profit, not every year, but any one year is gobsmacking. So what's happened is um, every few years they have these massive, massive kills and they're getting worse every time they have them. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the mechanism in just a second. It's really quite frightening of what happens. But um, this year, just a few weeks ago, I was notified that apparently, and I, the reason I say apparently is I haven't seen something from the industry yet to confirm, um, but I was notified that Tassal, the largest salmon company in the state, apparently lost about a million fish due to jellyfish in one day. And I'm waiting for confirmation. I have been told by another person who is a credible person, you know, credible source, that yes, it's true. It was Tassel and it's true. But again, I haven't seen anything from the industry yet. There's no public, you know, statement. There's no research. There's no nothing. Um, it, it might just go poof. We may never get confirmation. But the point is, you know, they're, they're having these, you know, massive losses. So jellyfish are vexing the salmon industry in unbelievable ways. Um, if they're small, the jellyfish get sucked in, they get in trained, you know, because the salmon are swimming around inside the net, creating a bit of a, a, a vortex, right? And the jellyfish, if they're small, they just get sucked right through the nets. And then the jellyfish panic and they exude lots of mucus that's saturated with stinging cells. And this goes straight into the gills and stings the gills, and so the fish breathe faster, and the mucus covers the gas exchange surface on the gills, so the salmon just suffocate. And I mean, you can lose a million fish in 30 minutes. Like, it's really, really shocking how fast and how severe the problem is. Um, for the fish that don't actually suffocate to death, they end up with gill damage and then they get all kinds of um, amoebae and, you know, the gill disease and all this, and then they just die miserably and slowly. But it's, it's really catastrophic what's happening. 
And so you'd think that the industry would be, you know, doing what they could to, you know, have fewer jellyfish. It's not that simple. Um, the jellyfish are living in, on, and around the infrastructure of these farms, and they're actually acting as a breeding ground for these jellyfish that are then damaging the industry. But, but with all of that said, there are a lot of things that they could do to make this less damaging to their own industry, like going on land, for example, total control over the water, no more jellyfish, easy. Here's the thing, and this is the part that concerns me the most. We see these, you know, fish kills happening with the salmon. There's no research on what the effect is on other industries and native species. It, there's no possibility, there is zero possibility that it's not having an effect on other organisms in the water, but there's no research on it, no funding, no research. And so, look, like I said, we're using prayer as a management strategy. We can look at what's happening with the salmon and go, mm, that sucks but we're flying blind on what the effect is on other species. To me, I think it's a disaster in the making. Well, I mean, it's a disaster already happening, but it's just getting worse and it will continue to get worse until we actually do something about it. So, sure. Lisa, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. My pleasure. It was both um, wonderful and appalling all at once. <laughs> This is a consumer question, not a science question. Is there a species that we can have for our Friday night takeaway that is sustainable? Yeah, look, uh, it's a good question. So, um, so for a long time, we were led to believe and, and we thought, that, and by we, I mean like humans, like all of us, it, we thought that aquaculture species are more sustainable than wild caught species. We now know that that's just not true. We now know that aquaculture species need to eat other species that are being taken out of nature to feed them. And you know, they're, they're eating a lot more than what they would be eating if they were just in the wild. But our appetite, our human appetite for fish is so enormous. We literally cannot sustain our human appetite for fish by fishing wild fish. Um, there are some species of fish that are more sustainable than others, but by that, the reason I got this funny tone in my voice when I say that, um, I'm kind of bending the word sustainable a little bit. Normally, we think sustainable means, you know, into the future, right? But it doesn't. When you talk about fish and you use the word sustainable, it doesn't mean into the future. It only means going bust more slowly. That's what it means. And so there are certain species of fish that we can eat and go bust more slowly. They're all wild caught, and I would suggest um, consuming them sparingly. Um, it, there is also actually, um, it, there, is, um, there is a farm up near Deloraine that is farming salmon on land. It's a boutique farmer. I, I can't remember, I think maybe it's called 41 degrees or 42 degrees, is that right? Yeah, and, um, and from what I understand, and I've spoken to quite a few people, I'm hoping to go up there and have a chat with the guy someday, but from what I understand, it is actually sustainable how he's farming the fish, they're healthy, um, you know, they don't have the antibiotics and, you know, all of that that the mass-produced fish have, um, you know, they're not um, causing the same sort of um, motor neuron disease, um, you know, the, the toxins in the drinking water, um, you know, the problems that we're having with the mass produced fish. We don't seem to be having these same problems with the way he's doing it. But my understanding is that the way he's doing it simply is not scale upable 
for mass production. Um, look, I gotta be honest, every time I buy fish, I ask myself that same question, like, am I part of the solution or am I part of the problem? The problem is I have to eat, you know, seriously, I have to eat, right? Um, I have gone right off salmon because I just don't believe, um, I, I, I just don't agree with it anymore, you know? Um, but I, I'm not judging you if, if you choose to eat it, you know? Um, yeah, look, I think octopus are probably fairly sustainable. I'm not really sure. I don't know that much about octopus. Um, you know, I think um, abalone are farmed on land, and my understanding is they're quite sustainable. Um, I think they're also um, quite boutique-y. Um, the urchins, I believe, are probably quite sustainable because they're an introduced pest. So I would say, yeah, take them out, take them out, right? But, you know, I'm not sure that you want to sit down to you know, <laughs> a barrel of urchins so that you end up you know, with enough to eat. Um, look, it, it's it's hard, I, and I, I'm I'm stumbling trying to give you the right answer because there really is no right answer. Uh, well, I, no, there is there is a right answer. We should be demanding more sustainable fish. We should be demanding healthier, more sustainable fish. That's the answer, rather than just going, oh well, I'm not really sure what to eat demand better. Yeah. Based on the examples you've given, you've given, I get the impression this is a salt water problem. Is it? Uh, is, is this a, in any way a freshwater problem? No, look, it's a good question. So there are freshwater jellyfish, but these aren't the problem ones. The problem ones are salt water. Um, I mean, there's plenty of problems with freshwater <laughs> and land and, you know, there's plenty of other problems that are impacting the world around us. So I'm just obviously limiting my scope, you know, to jellyfish. Yeah, yeah, but they're but they're not blooming in the same way and they're not whacking out the system in the same way. And there's only, I think, four species that live in freshwater. And and they're cute. They're little. Like you could swim with them. They they don't hurt and they're they're cute and they just look like little lacy little things. And and if you get a, um, like they're a, um, uh, oh, um, oh darn it, what's that lake? Um, uh, Meadowbank. They're at Meadowbank, they're at Trevallon, um, and, and there are other places too, but these are the places that I get heaps of reports every year at Meadowbank and Trevallon where people see these little freshwater jellyfish. And they're super cute. Like you could just put on a snorkel and just get in the water and it looks like a blizzard happening. Like they're really fantastic, and, you know, but they, they're not causing the same damage. So in that respect, yes, it is a saltwater thing. Yeah. <laughs> 